you bleed green? Are you an ultimate Eagles football fan? Well, you're in the right place. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> this is Bird 365, hosted by the new Mac and Mac, Jody McDonald and John McMullen. <laughs> Here we go, here we go! Who collectively have covered and talked about more than 50 plus years of Eagles football. Kick off your day with Birds 365. You'll get debate. We love to argue. You'll get the real story from inside the locker room. And you'll hear from some of the great football minds from around the region. You're about to become an Eagles insider. Get in the game. Join Jody Mack and Johnny Mack and join the football community that flocks to Birds 365. Birds 365 starts right now. Welcome to the NFL. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. E A G L E S Eagles. You got your Mac and Mac guys, John McMullen and Jody McDonald here with you for a full two hours of Birds 365 today. And we got plenty to chop up because they chopped it up yesterday in Orlando with Nick Sirianni talking to the media and a little later in the day, Jeffrey Laurie talking to the media, two of the major movers and shakers when it comes to the football team that we talk about every single day. Um, shoot, Seriani was on while we were on. Uh, you couldn't schedule around that. Thank you very much, NFL. You couldn't. Yeah. You wait. Oh, you wait coaches, to... coaches breakfast is scheduled every year, so I guess we can't uh, complain about that. On the on the day that we'd actually be okay with breaking Eagle news, waiting till ten o'clock. No, let's do it at eight o'clock, just as Mac. Seven forty-five. Actually, they get the jump start. Seven. That's true. There were a couple of quotes out there before we ever hit the airwaves yesterday. So yeah, they did it early with Sirianni. Later in the day with uh, Jeff Laurie. So let me start today's conversation with this: Who did you either learn more from yesterday, because Howie was the day before Sirianni and Jeff Laurie yesterday? Or who said something that most grabbed your attention yesterday, either the head coach or the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles? Uh, I, I would say Jeffrey. I mean, in these circumstances, I say all the time, whether it's Jeffrey, uh, uh, even more so than Howie, but with Howie and Nick, uh, Howie's always the more important one because we don't get to talk to him as much. Um, and, and with Jeffrey, even more so, it becomes, you know, because – Sometimes he only talks once, uh, sometimes twice a year. Uh, he's not Jerry Jones, to say the least. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm disappointed I wasn't there for him. Um, and you always get more. And obviously, he's the one guy who can speak freely if he wants to speak freely. Everybody else has to watch their P's and Q's. They're employees. He can say whatever the hell he wants. He can tell the truth. But, but he's very political. Uh, obviously, you know, he's not going out there and, and giving up all what he calls proprietary information, which I kind of chuckled at. Um, so it's always Jeffrey. Yeah. yeah. But Nick was on, on competitive advantage mode, which I, I find it ironically because he, he wouldn't confirm Cam Jurgens was the starting center. So Bob Groats is back into it, our buddy back in. Uh, but he did confirm it the day before to Tom Pelissero. Right. I mean, come on, Nick. What what, what, what maybe what, there's what, maybe what there's just that? one maybe there's just one guy in your crew that he doesn't want to give information to. If he's what, sitting what, it could be could have been Chris Franklin, because I saw the picture. He was sitting right next to him. Yeah, he had the catbird seat. Chris maybe he doesn't there. want to tell Franklin anything. Chris got there early. Who was on the other side? I forget. Uh, you know, uh, Brooks, Brooks Cabina, our buddy from the athletic. Yeah. You got to get there early to get the, uh, so you got to be an early riser to get uh competitive advantage nonsense. From Nick <laughs> oh, yeah. that's funny. And you said about uh, Jeffrey is the most uh, important because he doesn't report to anybody. He's the owner. His name is at the top of the masthead. But I will say this, and Howie spoke the day before. I would say Howie, of those individuals who spoke at the meetings the last two days, whose name isn't at the top of the masthead, who aren't an owner, he might have more flexibility to say something than anybody else. 
because we continually say he is basically got a job for life that he is so entwined with Jeff Lurie. Yeah, I don't believe that, by the way. I've never believed that. Um, he's really? got you haven't said that to me right here on Birds 365. Oh, yeah, I've said that before. He's got more rope than anybody. Well, that's you what know? I mean. He's got but, more rope than anybody else, other than the 32 owners. And or CEOs, because yeah, and then I say that's whatever. he that's would be one number his... one of anyone who's not an owner of the ability to say something and not be worried for his job. That's one of the, uh, but I won't go that extra step. I I say all the time that's one of his biggest advantages as yeah. his other uh, over other GMs. He 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 doesn't have to GM for his job, so to speak. Those guys have to GM for their jobs, mm -hmm. uh, and they turn it over. But I won't go the step far that he's got a lifetime job. That's all I'm saying. He's done it before. He was that close with Joe Banner at one point, and he moved on from Joe Banner. He he already demoted how he wants. He didn't technically demote him because he gave him a raise and a new title. But from Howie's perspective, he was certainly demoted because that's the part of the job Howie enjoys and wants the most, the personnel aspect, and he took that away from him. So that's a demotion no matter how you want to spin it. So he's done it in the past, and if things go horribly wrong, I'm not going to say he's got a lifetime job. And then the fact that Jeffrey's 72 and Julian's going to take over. That's why uh, when, the, when the name at the top of the mass head changes, then yeah. all bets are off. Yeah, so lifetime is well, where. Here's, here's where I'll say how he's got a lifetime job with Jeff Laurie as the owner. I, I don't think Howie Roseman can or will be fired while Jeff Flory is still running. The I job. would, I would, I, I'm in the 90s percent. I okay. agree with, but I'm not going to go 100. I'm, I'm 99. I'm, 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 I'm well, I'm well over nine, probably 95 percent. But there, there's a little sliver uh, of, you know, potential. You know, if they have three consecutive terrible seasons, which I don't think is going to happen because I think Howie's very good at his job. I don't right. think how he should be fired. I think he's very good at his job. So but and I, 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 I can't go that extra step. Fair that enough. Flight I'm, flight. I'm a little further down the line than you, but we're close. Um, and I was a guy who, when the season ended and there was a good percentage of Eagle fans, both here on our stream on Birds 365, WIP phone lines, uh, wherever Eagle opinions are generated, thought that Nick Sirianni needed to talk, talk about uh, a life job for a lifetime. Nick Sirianni's life could have ended at any minute because the Eagle fans wanted to run him out of town on a rail. I was one who said, no, I think there's a good chance Jeffrey's going to save his job, that they'll try and thread the needle here. They'll make changes, but Jeff just might look at the big picture and say, well, let's look at from the day we hired Nick Sirianni to the day we're having a conversation as to whether we're going to keep him or not. And the big picture looked pretty good. And Jeff expanded on that yesterday, uh, throwing out numbers 31 7. Extraordinary, by the way. I'm glad you brought that up. Extraordinary is what he called 31 and 7. Yes. And by the way, he's right. Exactly. Uh, it, is, it is extraordinary. Um, but. You know, I, I looked at that quote a little bit differently because he, he said, um, we got to get better than that. We got to get back to that. And not only do we have to get back to that, we got to get better than that. And I right. think that's unrealistic. Because they so, didn't win the Super Bowl, meaning they got to win a Super Bowl because they came as close as you can to winning a Super Bowl without winning a Super Bowl. So that's where the better comes in. Um, I, I understood where Jeffrey was coming from. And I actually even endorsed uh, Sirianni keeping his job. After listening to Sirianni yesterday, I'm less confident in my stance. Um, I was not impressed by Nick Sirianni. I'm actually kind of worried about Nick Sirianni in certain aspects. And the biggest one for me, Johnny Mac, is coaching hiring. Now, this has been a bugaboo for the Eagles basically since they won that Super Bowl in 2017. Because when Doug Peterson was hired, he was like, yeah, whoever you want to give me is a coach, shall we? As a coaching staff, go ahead, knock yourself out. I'm the head coach. That's the only thing that I'm worried about. And over time, as he won, he became more possessive of his coaching staff and putting his foot down about his coaching staff. And it actually cost him his job. So they move on from Doug and they hire Sirianni and Sirianni had for me much more say in putting his initial coaching staff together than Doug ever had on any of his staffs. 
And he specifically said yesterday, I hired Kellen Moore. Not we hired Kellen Moore. I hired Kellen Moore. Yeah. So let's do a quick check of uh, Nick Sirianni and his coaching hirings since he became the head coach of the Eagles. As per John McMullen, and I lean on you for this because I didn't know this, the Eagles hired their defensive coordinator before they ever hired the head coach. That they were no, locked in I, on I, Gannon I, before I, they I'm hired getting, Sirianni. I, because I've gotten pushback on this. They didn't hire him. They, they've they made it known that they were going to hire him. So, uh, Under, you know, that, it's semantics, but uh, uh, I want to make that might, It might be more than semantics, but I think you're, the bottom line is, I think your point is on, and I trust your point, and I think you're accurate. If, if Josh McDaniels had been... The Eagles' defense uh, head coach Jonathan would have been Gannon a defensive coordinator. The defensive coordinator, yes, exactly. So that tells me what I need to know there. So it wasn't even though Sirianni and Gannon knew each other. I don't believe that was Sirianni's hire. That was, I believe that was an Eagle hire. So he gets credit for Shane Steichen. I certainly give him credit for that. And since then, he hired Sean Desai, who was so bad that he needed to be replaced in season in a panic move. That was a Sirianni hire. He elevated Brian Johnson, who was so questionable, was fired after just one year. Why are we? And let me add Denard Wilson to that group, too, because he could have hired Denard Wilson rather than hire Sean Desai. He decided no. And then depending on who you talk to, Denard Wilson would have stuck around and coached the DBs again. And he said, no, I think that's a bad fit. Uh, no, I wish you well. Best of luck getting a job somewhere else. And basically pushed him out the door. Wilson goes down, helps the Ravens uh, win the most games in the AFC. Now he's a defensive quarter in Tennessee. And Sirianni said, yeah, no, no. Thanks, Dart. Thanks for the memory. Um, wh why are we entrusting hiring coordinators, important coaching positions to Nick Sirianni on what his track record is since he got here? Um, well, hey, I don't think the track record is, is as bad as, uh, I don't know, some people may think. Um, well, I just I ran down three pretty big flops for me. You want to defend Nick Sirianni's coaching hiring? Have at it. Well, number one, I would say Gannon, I, you know, it, Gannon's sort of in the middle, very similar to Vic Mangio, because everybody was on board with Gannon. It wasn't like uh, the Eagles said, oh, you have to hire Jonathan Gannon, and Nick Sirianni had a problem with it. Those two were very close. It just happened to work out. It was a coincidence, basically, that they moved on um, and said, um, you know, Jeffrey, I think very <laughs> – one of one of his best moves was like, no, we're not going to go with Josh McDaniels. I don't think that's going to work out long term. We're going to keep interviewing, and it just happened to work out that they liked Nick Sirianni, who worked with Jonathan Gannon in the past, and liked Jonathan Gannon. So that's sort of like half and half, very similar to Vic Fangio now, Agreed. because everybody wanted Vic Fangio, but Nick wanted him, Jeffrey wanted him, uh, how we want everybody wanted uh, Vic Fangio to be the defensive coordinator. So. I don't know. I a I would say. Um, so we're talking about Sean Desai, and we're talking about essentially Brian Johnson, who failed. And by the way, Jeffrey does it very nicely. Very, um, you know, he's got the suit on. Uh, he's very political. He's he's very, but he buried the coordinators yesterday. He buried the coordinators. Now a lot of people say he should have. You know, they, they fired him. Now the assumption that. We all say, did was it Nick's idea or was it Jeffrey's idea that he had to move on? And by the way, defensively, everybody was on board. Now, if you put true serum on, on Nick Sirianni, I do believe he would have liked to have kept Brian Johnson. I do believe that out of loyalty and a, a bunch of other things and, and closeness. I do believe that. But I also believe... He can read the room and whether you want to call it political, whether you want to call it conformity, whether he went into the room and said, I got to change coordinators or Jeffrey said, you got to change coordinators. He knew when he stepped into that room, he can read the room. He's got political savvy. And I'm talking about Nick Sirianni. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the reference of, 
Oh, I didn't bring it up, but I was on board with it. I'll look up the exact quote. Jeffrey said, no, I didn't. It was all Nick's idea, but I, I was completely behind it. Um, he knew if he wanted to be the Philadelphia Eagles head coach, I'm talking about Nick Sirianni in 2024, he had to change both coordinators again, defensively wasn't a problem at that point. It was Matt Patricia, um, uh, so we're only talking about one guy, Brian Johnson. And, you know, whether that's good or bad, you can discuss. I would say understanding being able to read a room is probably a good thing um, if you're a if you're a head coach, which is a management position. But he buried the coordinators. And he also made a big deal about the experience of Vic Banjo and Kellen Moore, which I get because you're coming off um, – Two failures, Brian Johnson, first-time coordinator, Sean Desai had one year, wasn't successful in Chicago. Well, guess what? Shane Steigen had one year, wasn't that successful with the Chargers. Jonathan Gannon was the first-time deep, uh, defensive coordinator. That worked out pretty stinking well. So, you know, this this the scapegoating was there, as I expected it to be. It existed. It needed to be done. And the only question was, was Jet, was Nick Sirianni going to go along with it? So to me, it's not a matter of, was it explicitly ordered or Nick had, as I said, the political savvy to understand it. So all of these hires are, uh, whether you want to call it conformity, whatever, but the one guy, and what that's why he's the most important, that can veto it, as you've seen in the past with Mike Rowe and Press Taylor and Matt Burke, and Corey Unlin, the one guy who can veto anything is Jeffrey Lurie. And Jeffrey Lurie's like everybody else. He's a very good owner. But this is, and when he talked about Nick's job security, he he said every coach is in a high-pressure situation. You know, he would not say, oh, no, he's not, you know, he, and no problems whatsoever. Every coach, and he's right. You know, Bum Phillips' old quote, there's two kinds of coaches, them that's fired and them that's going to be fired. That, that, that's it. Um, it. It happens to everybody. Everybody's got a shelf life. So that's no surprise. But he's a lame duck. And from what I look at, and I talk about that 31 and 7 extraordinary quote, he's in the same position. We were talked a lot about Saquon yesterday about – well, there are no more excuses. You can say that about a bunch of players. Jalen Hurts, Saquon Barkley on the offensive side of the ball. You can talk about it with Nick Sirianni. Jeffrey Lurie essentially said there are no excuses. you got great coordinators now. The coordinators were to blame. Now you got – he's not Greek, as Mark Barzetta pointed out, but that's my explicit – the mythical Greek god of defense, Vic Fangio. And you have Kellen Moore – with the new ideas and the fresh ideas, and he's going to get Saquon and Barkley involved, and he's a weapon, and you already got A.J. Brown, and you already got all this talent. Woo! Yeah. But Good here, luck. Here's Good luck. Up, uh, you used the word great. I don't know that they got great coordinators. They have improved coordinators. Over what they had last year, they definitely upgraded. Was the Miami Dolphin defense great this year? No, it was good and much like with the Eagles, improved. Um, were the Chargers great on offense this past year? No. I don't know that I would use the word great, great, new great coordinators for either of the two guys Eagles hired. Improved, absolutely. And they had to be improved, and they are improved, and I expect them to be improved. And, yeah, maybe even they'll stamp themselves as great. They're not great yet. That That needs to be played out over the 2024 season. And just uh, maybe I need to ask it for you as a question. What is your evaluation of Nick Sirianni as a coaching evaluator, making hirings for his staff? Since Nick Sirianni got here, he was either the man or a heavily involved uh, guy in the decision making. What do you look at Nick Sirianni as, as a coaching evaluator and hirer? I think he's above average. Really? I, I, I think that I think he first, sucks. I think that first staff proved to be a very good staff. And I think a lot of people 
um, looked at it at the time, including myself, and said, where's the experience? Um, I know I, I talked about that a lot. And hey, who guess the, what? Who were the good? Uh, Gannon? Gannon? Steichen? We, we all agree. Clay? <laughs> was, a, was a group hiring. And if you're going to put him in order, Sirianni was probably third out of the three who said, let's get Jonathan Gannon in here. Steichen, he absolutely gets credit for it. That's a home run. No questions asked. Stoutland was already here. Who else from that staff really was a major contributor to that team going to the Super Bowl? Well, I'd look at it um, a couple different ways when it comes to coaches because we can't judge them. We don't have stats like we do for players. And even, uh, that's, it's, you, it's, even it's that, you got to – more to use yeah. the John McMullen word, esoteric, yes. which I like. It's so, very true. But that's what I'm asking you to do. Get esoteric on me and tell me how you well, think that's he's why I, I And that's why I say he's above average because I think that first staff was very good because part of your job as a head coach, and Jeffrey got into this a little bit, I really do think there's so much management point of it that people don't understand. Um, it's far bigger than X and O's. And as people talk, well, you got to call the plays. You got That's a very small part of it. It's a very big job. Um, and one of the things the Eagles, as they tend to do, as they kick Doug Peterson in the ass out the door, was spin that. He didn't coach his coach as well. So part of it is, you you got to coach your coaches and you got to get them up to speed. You know, there's a number of guys. Jeffrey made a slip about Michael Clay, who's turned into, you know, a beaming example of, ironically, patience in a year they didn't have patience with other young coaches. Um, and he just did a really good job. It's a wonder how personnel helps with that. Uh, but he used the term inherited when he talked about Michael Clay. He didn't inherit Michael Clay. Michael Clay was in San Francisco. Uh, Michael Clay came back. Michael Clay was in Philadelphia as the assistant special teams coach uh, with Chip Kelly, and then he followed Chip Kelly um, to San Francisco, and then he returned to Philadelphia right. in 2021, Nick Sirianni's first season. He didn't inherit Michael Clay. So what did that tell me? That told me he also didn't hire Michael Clay because Jeffrey, you know, mixed it up. Right. But, you know, that wasn't, that was, that a, was that given was a, to him. That was a Howie hire. Yeah, that, that was given. Him. That that was given to him. And I that's agree. turned and out to Stoutland be. Stoutland was given to him. And the better coaches, I think, were given to him. The ones that Nick has picked, other than Steichen, and like I said, Steichen, major good hire. That's a that's a bases clearing double up in the gap, driving in three runs. I think he took a lot of swing and misses on the other ones that I think were his hires. Of which yesterday he took credit for Kellen Moore. That wasn't a we hired Kellen Moore. I hired Kellen Moore. When he said that, that jumped out to me, Johnny Mac. And well, it, that, it, 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 I'll tell you why it didn't jump out, and we got to get to Mike Gill. It didn't, he always says, I hired, I hired, I hired. So we all, do we believe it? Number one, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, when it was fired, I'm, I'm, I think I was one of the first, I believe Nick. I believe Nick demoted Sean Desai. I've said that from, and I I, I think that's a fireable offense, ironically. Um you know, I believe him because of certain things that, that I know. So there's some I don't know, you know, um, Michael Clay. How did Michael Clay come into existence? Well, I know he didn't inherit him because he wasn't here. Uh, Brian Johnson. Now, all of a sudden, Brian Johnson's a Nick Sirianni guy. Well, Brian Johnson wasn't a Nick Sirianni guy when they hired him. Right. When he came um, in the building, he came in as a Howie guy. Yeah. But when you get promoted – from quarterback coach to offense quarter, we were led to believe that was Nick's call. He hired his offense quarter. He chose Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson was handed to him on a silver platter, but he had the final say on that. Do you not agree mm. with that? No, that one's a little political. I've used that term a couple times. Look, I don't know. I think if we're up to Nick Seriati, Kevin Petullo would have been the offensive quarter. Really? That's my assumption. Now, that that's not... Kevin's job might be too big to maybe he, he doesn't want him to be the offensive corner. Kevin's got a big job. Kevin Petula. He's the, clo I, I've said this from here. He's the closest 
coach to Nick Sirianni, even closer than Shane Steichen. He's the closest one. Um, he does a lot of crap for Nick Sirianni. That that, but so maybe he's too valuable to be the coordinator in his position. Okay, but I think he's the guy that he you know trusts the most. Um, and certainly from an he's an offensive guy, passing game coordinator, associate head coach. Um, he would have been the head coach when Nick was sick with COVID. If people remember, he even did a presser. He was going to yeah. coach the team, not Shane Steichen, not Jonathan Gannon. Kevin Petula was going to coach the team. Um, so I, I, I would say the, the political part of it, I'm talking about Jeffrey Lurie, love Brian Johnson, might want to distance himself now. Howie Roseman, love Brian Johnson, might want to distance himself now. Not might, they both did. Yeah. Um, Jalen Hurts, love Brian Johnson, which was a big part of it, obviously. And I'm not saying Nick didn't, but just that Nick is very close to Kevin. And, oh, by the way, might be a good thing that he didn't go back down that road again with Petulo when you're pushing Brian Johnson out the door and you're not on the steadiest of footing. You might not want to say, see, I, I kind of told you guys Petulo would have been better. Smart. Nick, it, Nick it does have the ability to read the room, as you said. He's McMullen on McDonald, Macamac, Birds 365. Well, what do you know? It's early Wednesday. Mike Gill's not in Clearwater. He's here with us on Birds 365. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker, Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was gonna be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was gonna be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was gonna be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. A hump day edition of Birds 365. Wednesday get together McMullen McDonald. And Mikey Gill, 
Who's talking to someone else other than us? Do you do you need a minute here, Mike? Where I'm just I, being I, told I, that the uh, 1.1 billion uh, lottery was hit in New Jersey today. So wow, really? 1.1 billion. Did we win? Well, I got off the plane the last night though. at 3 a.m. I was wow. delayed four times. Oh, that, that stinks. Tampa? So you, did, you didn't get back in time to buy a ticket, so you have no chance of winning is what exactly. you're telling us. Exactly. That, uh, Atlantic City to Tampa route? Is that where Mike Gill went? Yeah. I was on the Atlantic Tampa to Atlantic City. City. It was supposed to leave at 9.50. It left at 12.50. Oh, that's Ooh, nice. that's tough. Right. Well, uh, we but you're a gamer. Game. We're good. Yeah, we're glad you got up. Um, Maya Copas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not. They did give me a fifty dollar voucher. Wow, fifty oh, got a fifty wow. spot okay. out of it. You didn't even yeah. get to turn that into lottery ticket. I have to important. use by June twenty fourth, though. Oh, <laughs> See, that's such a loss leader. That's crap. All right, all right, forget your your traveling itinerary. Let's talk birds. Um, <laughs> here's one of the questions I came out of. Have you, you had a chance to catch all the Sirianni slash Lori uh, diatribes yesterday at the uh, owners' meetings? Um, I'm kind of off on a jag this morning about Sirianni and his ability to put together a staff, hire his coaching staff. Um, were you surprised yesterday when he said, when I hired Kellen Moore? That was Nick Sirianni's. That wasn't, uh, that's a direct quote. That's not paraphrasing. I hired Kellen Moore. Does that scare you at all, Mike? Well, I happened to be on the last time he said that, and you asked me about that, and we were a little surprised that he kind of, it almost like he went out of his way to say that. He did it again yesterday. Same thing. I had the same exact response. Now, at first, you were like, he kind of went out of his way to do that. But did it change at all when Lori also stuck to the story? No, I, I, I think kind of phrased it covered. as, you know, Nick reading the room. Like, Nick is smart enough to know that if he walked in there and said, yeah, no changes, Brian's coming back, uh, then he's probably... So, does it really matter if he was ordered to or he understood he had to, I guess? Well, my because question, but... Jeffrey yesterday <laughs> said, you know, he, I like the fact that he came up and, and picked these kind of picked these guys uh, uh, more and, and Fangio. Like they, it almost seemed like him and Roseman, which I thought was interesting because for the first time in my life, I felt like, huh. Was he kind of questioning Roseman as well? Because he was like, Roseman and Sirianni came, and I liked their plan. As if they were together on this, like, hey, we're in some hot water here. We need to get together. And now, that's the first time I've ever been like, because to me, I feel like Lori and Roseman are, as long as Lori's here, Roseman's here. He's got a lifetime pass as the GM of this team, whether he deserves it or not is a whole nother tangent. But that being said, I almost felt like this was more of a collaborative effort between the two. But then you might say, well, if it was between the two, wouldn't the third guy, Lori, be involved in the decision making as well? Eh, most likely. And yeah. it, you know, made me think of would have liked to have been a fly, even without audio, a fly in the wall, uh, on the wall in the room, just to see the seating arrangement. Because that could tell you something as to were Lori and Roseman on one side of the desk and Siri on the other, or was it Sirianni and Roseman on one side of the desk and Lori on the other? That might have been. A little I think fun. it was one on. I think it was one on one, and 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 Jeffrey made it. Uh, you don't think or, how he was in the room no, when Sirianni no, made his presentation? No. Here's how I'm going to fix the Eagles. Nope. Really? Um, nope. In fact, um, and Jeff McLean was the first to uh, uh, break this. Um, so I'll give him credit. Uh, uh, Nick Sirianni doesn't report to Howie Roseman. Nick Sirianni reports to Jeffrey Lurie. That's it. Uh, he split it. Uh, so Howie reports to Jeffrey. Nick reports to Jeffrey. Uh, one thing he said at the beginning. Um, same business so is it two- misunderstood by the fans and people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, how yeah. much say or not say, but. That, I feel like people think Roseman is basically like this yeah, guy who's in yeah, charge of everything. Yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, it's completely misunderstood. Um, 
But from Jeffrey's perspective, and he started the whole process of, no, nothing changed. We had the same meeting we always have. And he has meetings with Howie. And he has meetings with Nick after the season. He has meetings with head coach. He did it with Nick, everybody, obviously. He does it every year, same way. And he said, there's no biases. There's no recency bias. There's no licency bias. There's no bias whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and this is the conclusion I came to. Now, all of that is kind of who he is. I said, it doesn't matter. But no, I don't believe. No, he he meets with them separately. Nick had to have his plan. How he's got to have his plan. How his plan more revolves around personnel, um, and obviously Nick, the coaching staff, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it's very misunderstood. I really do. Yeah, I'm, yeah. He um he opened up, and, and look, I give Lori credit for the way that he presents this. As hey, listen. We didn't want to look at the last six games. We wanted to look at the 31 and seven. That's a really good record, which I do to agree with. Sometimes as fans, people only want to take the most recent thing that you saw, which was a disaster. And I think we all acknowledge that. But in that you're saying, well, then how did you get to 31 and seven? Is there anything in 31 and seven, three playoff appearances and a Super Bowl appearance that is still in there? And I think <laughs> – Astutely, he said, there has to be. So what happened in those last seven? I don't know. But I was willing to find out if that is going to rear its ugly head when this season starts again and give this guy another shot. To which people then say, well, now you put the guy in a bad spot because he's a lame duck. And it, the appearance is that he's just kind of here for you know, whatever reason so that you can control the narrative that you hit these coaches all the time, whatever it might be. I, uh, my, me, oh, go ahead, Jody. Yeah, let me uh, – let, and uh, the people on the stream aren't happy with me because I'm apparently creating a controversy that isn't there. I'm just giving you my opinion. I'm just giving you what I heard yesterday out of Nick Sirianni, and I'm going to give you another thing I didn't necessarily understand and or like. He said that Kellen Moore, who he hired, not we hired, I hired Kellen Moore, um, is come in. And he's doing a good job and he's working hard. And then when he was asked about, well, what's the offense really going to look like with you and Kellen Moore? You've been an offensive coach. He's your new offensive quarter. The answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Wait a minute. You just told me he showed up. He's working hard. He's fitting in. But the offense is going to be, I don't know. Wait, it can't be both of these things. Either you like your hire. It's working out. And here's what it's probably going to look like. I didn't expect them to start drawing up plays and telling us, here's the percentages of run to pass. It didn't have to get real specific, but I would have expected better than I don't know. That's what we got out of him yesterday when asked how he and Kellen Moore are going to be able to put the offense together. Is yeah. that not disconcerting? Well, I mean, it, it, it's funny. I was so yesterday in my travels to the airport, the gentleman who gave me a ride to the airport happens to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers radio um, sideline guy. So he was laughing about how the owners meetings are an hour up the road in Tampa and that the Glazers never speak. Their office is across the street from where we were sitting, but they have to drive an hour to go actually talk to the owner for the only time he'll talk all year long to which he said, why the hell are people going to listen to these guys talk in March? Who cares? And I said, you obviously don't live in the Northeast where they will literally sit on every word and how it's said in the month of March. So mm -hmm. if this was August and maybe they had been on the field a few times, they haven't even had a mini camp yet to see uh, some seven on seven. I may read a little bit more into that, but you know, he mentioned yesterday about Saquon Barkley. Um, and they want to try to, it's like AJ Brown, good players fit well into the scheme. Uh, he's a really good player. What's he going to look like in there? Well, I don't know. We haven't even been on the field yet. I kind of took it more like that than the concern that you said you might have. So I might be more in the TJ camp on this one where it's March. I'll <laughs> wait to uh, reserve judgment to see if this offense has some sort of identity, which I'm very intrigued, Jody, on what the identity will be this year, because last year they had none. Um, 
Well, I would say to Jody's point, I mean, he was in competitive advantage mode. Oh. So it's not like he doesn't know. There's that it's as he well. Doesn't, he doesn't, yeah, which I, I agree is silly, but I mean, that's what it is. He wouldn't even name, he named Cam Jurgens the starting senator the day before, and he wouldn't do it in front of the Philly reporters. Oh, well, the, we, we got time. I well, he tried to compare team. the whole offense. You know, we got AJ, we had to find out what he did well. Yeah. I don't know. I guess you trade it for a guy that you didn't know what he did well. That doesn't sound to, to be. I mean, you've seen Saquon Barkley for the last five years. Do you not know what he got to well, figure out what he does well? well. Yeah. There could be the element that you think that he can do more well than the Giants got out of him. Well, yeah, better. Yeah. Better and I think that's what the paycheck says. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of uh, the paycheck of Saquon Barkley, uh, one one interesting thing Jeffrey said um, was taking advantage of market inefficiencies. Or is that Howie? I'm getting it all conflated. Um, which I, I, think I, I think that was a Jeffrey thing. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey, which, you know, is Howie playing 3D chess and, and saying, let's create this market inefficiency and then seize on that market inefficiency? Is that what we're doing? Is that how advanced Howie Roseman is? That's a you know it's funny you say that because at at any like they're just I, I was on vacation last week and I feel like every day I was like they got what they got this guy there's guys I've lost track now with guys they're still bringing in it's just a joke of like what the salary cap is and who's in circumventing it and how you're doing it and you're talking about inefficiencies I don't think they're looking at that number at all he just I said but this is the thing to me that is crazy when it's all what I always think about it, I said. He can't be the only one that knows how to do all this stuff. It, yeah, it's, you would think. Well, people, um, you know, it was ironic. I think it was Brandon Bean. I think it was Buffalo who thought they were going to get compensatory picks are a big thing. Usually Nick Court or Corte, I, I, don't, I don't know how. He does a real Jimmy Kemsky locally, but Nick nationally, he almost gets those things right every year, understands it. He got it wrong. And for the first time, the NFL teams thought, like Buffalo thought they were getting a third round compensatory pick. It turned into a fourth round. And they were like, what's going on here? And evidently it had something to do with voidable years. The Eagles are at the forefront of that. And it yep. changed the, the, the contractual thing and it knocked them down. I think the NFL teams are starting to catch up because everybody's doing it now. And I think the NFL is going to stop it or at least, put more of a limit on it at some point, or I think they're going to look at it. Yeah, it's like a Google algorithm. You're like trying yeah. to figure out what they changed to get your, you know, website higher up. I I was trying to think of this. The last time I was on the air was uh, last Tuesday. And we were talking about when was the time, is there a player that the Eagles had to cut because of financial re They just, like Sandy, uh, the, the Chargers, they were cutting guys they didn't want to cut. Buffalo were cutting guys they didn't want to cut. They just couldn't figure out ways to keep them. I can't figure out a time where the Eagles just flat out couldn't keep a guy because of a mistake or the way they handled the cap. Well, and you know who deserves credit for that? It, it is Howie and it's Jake Rosenberg and it's Bryce Johnston and all his lieutenants, but it, that's Jeffrey. That's where Jeffrey gets a plus marks because there are certain teams that won't. The salary cap is bookkeeping. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. It's accounting. That that's that's all it is. The real money is what matters and what you're willing to pay out. And there's some people that aren't willing to pay out. You know, think of it, Jody. You're a baseball guy, Bobby Bonilla Day. You know how many how many years, how many deferred payments. Uh, are they paying Bobby Bonilla? Are they still paying Bobby yeah, Bonilla? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's got like 10 more years to go. Well, some owners don't want to do that. Right. Um, and and be years down the road and paying guys who, who uh, and, and, and it's not even paying because the money's already outlaid. It's about, it's on the books, uh, on the books. Uh, in the case of the NFL, in the case of these voidable years, like Jason Kelsey's still on the books. Fletcher Cox still on the books. They're not playing for the Eagles anymore. I had a bunch of fans say, that's not fair. It's not new money. It's accounting. They haven't accounted for the money they've already paid. A lot of owners aren't willing to do that. Jeffrey's like, yeah, go ahead, do it. Carson Wentz, 
We had that discussion how many times, Jody, during that offseason? Most dead money in NFL history. Yep. Now, how much did Denver pay Russell Wilson to get the hell out of town? How much was that? that well, and the Eagles kind of set yeah. the precedent. Yeah. The, Eagle, the Eagles kind of set the precedent on that. I mean, yes. I remember – um, when they made the Wentz move, I mean Andrew Brandt, who had been working uh, the league, for, he was. This he was is like, not yeah. happening. There's no way the Eagles are going to do that dead money. This was unheard of. Exactly. It was unheard of. So unheard when, they, of. when they did that move with the dead money that they ended up accumulating, it, it was unheard. And now other teams are saying, "Well, if they did it, <laughs> we can figure out a way to do it too." And yeah. all, being ahead of the curve is. 90% of the time a winner. Sometimes you're ahead of the curve and you're wrong, but not often. More often than the time, if you're ahead of the curve, you're getting it right. And specifically with the Eagles, so I, that's I guess the case. I guess the 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 follow-up in my mind would be is the value that Roseman brings in those areas so valuable that he does get the lifetime pass almost. Because you always say in these situations, I always think of it like this, like you know, we've all worked in – Jody, you've been in radio for a while. The engineer is a guy that's always like, <laughs> don't talk to the engineer. He's a he's a guy that eh. – Torture he's genius. He's the only one yeah. that knows how to fix the stuff. And I think Lori and Roseman are this team that they create the stuff and they might make mistakes and they might have things go wrong. But they also know how to get out of it. Some people will say, well, he made all these mistakes, but he also knows how to fix them. Fix them, right. And is that is that is that worth enough that he would be um, able to be making all these decisions and be a part of all these conversations? If you think that he's a part of the coaching hires and 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 all that stuff. Well, John and I said, "Earl, John's ninety five percent. I'm ninety nine percent on Howie lifetime contract, and lifetime for me is up until Julian takes over. Then, then you, you got to yeah, Jeffrey's lifetime. Yeah, yeah, Jeffrey's lifetime is owner." Yeah. Yeah, John's at 99. I'm, I said, uh, what's John's the relationship between Julian and Howie? I mean, was Howie like his well, baby we don't know. at some point I, or what? I, I, I mean, Julian's much younger. He's very close to Alec Hallaby. So who knows? Alec Hallaby might be Julian's Howie Roseman. Right. Who knows? And then all Howie's time. not an old guy. No, he's not. No, but he's but he's been around for a long time. He's Julian. been around a while, which is another fascinating story is that he never thought to leave. No one ever approached him. I mean, Philadelphia is a glamour job, but it's not the most glamorous job. Well, nobody wanted him after uh, Chip. He was demoted, and and that's another thing. I and oh, that's why I'm at 95, ago. Mike. Um, Jeffrey Lurie already had this type of relationship with Joe Banner, and they had a uh, 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 dust up, and and he moved on. Um, that was a childhood friend. That's how close he was to Joe. Um, and he already demoted how he wants. Now he calls it his greatest mistake. So I think he real, and it was by the way, um, you know, now, and I say demoted, he gave him a raise while doing it and he gave him a new shiny new job title. But the bottom line is he took away what, how he wanted most. And that was the personnel aspect of the job. So he's done it before. That's why I can't get to 100. But, yeah, all the other GMs have to GM for their job, is how I disclaim. Uh, Brian Poles, who I criticize a lot. The NFC North, Kwesi Odopa Mensa. He's done. He's croaked. He's done. Um, those guys get two, three years windows, and that's it. That's it. Um, and if it's not looking good, they're going to move on to the next guy. Howie. He's got the the rope to make mistakes, and that's the most important part of it because everybody makes thing, mistakes. Everybody tries to emulate a lot of what the Eagles do by hiring their minions, but the one thing they don't emulate is the patience they have had. Yes, with yes, yes. And let, let me say this. This is probably going to get me in trouble, but I'm sorry. I just love to tell this story, and I don't think I've ever told it in three years on Birds 365. Jeff Lurie, God bless him. We love him. He's a great owner. He can be worked. And I think that's what got Joe Banner fired. He didn't know how to work Jeff Lurie. Others have figured out how to work Jeff Lurie. Howie Roseman is sure as hell figured out to work Jeff Lurie. I think we're seeing this offseason. Nick Sirianni has learned to work Jeff Lurie in that, like you said, John, he could read the room ahead of time. 
and he knew how to enter specific conversations and meetings and give the owner what he wanted as best he could to a point. Doug Peterson couldn't work him. Doug, Doug, Doug just didn't attempt to work him. He just said, he no, didn't want look, he didn't see want you later, bye. At the end, yeah. At I, the end. A former Eagle coach under Jeff Laurie, which kind of swings the, shrinks the room real fast. There haven't been all that many of them, um, told me that there was a year where they specifically wanted one player in the first round of the draft that don't tell you they were going to get him. And Jeff used to, they had meetings and inquis inquisitions and what we like, whatever. And he had his video guy put together a tape of the five or six potential choices at the position they were looking at, blah, blah, blah. And he sat down there and watched the guy edit the tape and helped him edit the tape and put together the tape. And then they handed it to Jeff. Jeff, we'd like your input on this. And the tape was edited specifically for pointing to this one player that the coach wanted to take, that he really thought was the guy to take. And they did some very good editing. You can edit anything to make it look good or look bad. So they give Jeff the tape. He comes back the next day and specifically says, oh, I'm off this, there's no question. I would say this is the player we should be leaning toward. And he go, really, Jeffrey? Is that the guy you like? Yeah, of course it's a, He's much the best. Oh, okay, we'll, then, then we'll lean in that direction. And that's the exact player that they took. They worked him. People who worked all the time, and Jeff Laurie, as great as he is, can be worked. And I think he got worked a little this offseason by Nick Sirianni. I think Sirianni did a great job of keeping his job, of knowing what to say, on knowing how to say it, and that helped save his job. And I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Well, I was just going, I was going to say, well, then credit Sirianni then. <laughs> like, I give him credit for saving his job, but I'm looking at it from what is best for the Philadelphia Eagles, not what's best for Nick Sirianni. And ever since, and because I was one that said, I think Nick should keep his job. I was kind of in line with that, with what he had accomplished over the enti entirety of his three-year career as Eagle coach. The way he's handling his I business. Say, he works Jeff Laurie, but he can't work us as Eagle well, fans. Whatever. Well, I'm not going to tell you Gam Jorgens is my center. He doesn't even attempt to work us. He doesn't give a crap about us. He's no. he worried well, about his job. No, he doesn't uh, give a crap. But isn't that isn't that a good thing that he? I yeah. mean, it's he funny. shouldn't. Yeah, he it's shouldn't. funny. He's the pander in chief in some aspects, but that's him. So maybe Sirianni's a little smarter than people want to give him credit. Ah, uh, yeah, he true. definitely is. Oh, well, that first of all, yeah. I mean, yeah, I I coined the pander in chief. I'm taking yeah. credit for that. Yeah. Um, victory lap. I, you know, yeah, the goopiness about putting on the Philly shirts and the and the Sixers and the Flyers. I mean, yeah, he he knows, and he's a Pirates fan and all this crap, and no, nobody knows and nobody cares, uh, nor should they. Um, it's not his job. His job is to coach the build up Eagles, but yeah, he's very good with that kind of stuff. And and I don't want to say if it's manipulating, you know, that takes on a negative connotation, um, but. That's this whole thing, connecting with people. You know, how do you connect with a, a Philadelphia sports fan? That's pretty easy if you really think about it. Four for four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, Maybe he's smart. Sirianni he's smart. last year. See, uh, the story the other day about Bill Self basically admitting that he was already thinking about next year. I mean, maybe Sirianni with that team last year was just like, I'm done with this team and just knew not to say it. Well. Yeah, he better not say that. But that's my one concern. Exactly. But I'm saying, like, yeah. so he read the room enough to be like, I'm done with this was, team, man. Was it, when, was it when Jonathan Gannon poked him in the eye at home that he said, we can't beat friggin' Jonathan Gannon and his Cardinals? Yeah. We're screwed. We but suck. This is the, Let's give up. This goes back to the Carton stuff where, like, maybe there was just something that he was like, you know what? I'm done dealing with these guys in here, man. It's just what happened to the Carton stuff, by the way? That's the first time I heard it. It's going to yeah, happen any funny. day now. It's any day now that's going to come to light. Um, you know, it, it is funny when you talk about uh, uh, Nick Sirianni. It was Randy. We had Randy Mueller on. and I Because Jody will tell you, I was in the camp of, you can't fire this guy. It's ridiculous. 31 and 7, Jeffrey. Paul I did tonight. agree with what you said earlier, John, and I said the same thing on my show, which was if he made the decision to fire the defensive coordinator, that was a fireball yeah, offense because I of the agree. result. The I result agree. of that I was, got that from me since we're laying claim to things. Yeah. 
I yeah. was the it was result a terrible that's offense. The... You make that decision, and the guy you put in is worse than the yeah. guy you said is fireable. Yeah. I said, I, I said that if you wanted Nick Sirianni fired, everybody was saying offense this, offense that. They were top ten in every stinking meaningful offensive category. Don't start with that. Start with Sean Desai. If you want him fired, that was the biggest mistake. But Randy brought up, and I admit this made me think. He, he said, your job as an NFL coach is to fix things. That's it. He couldn't fix anything. And then I started thinking about that because I kept, I, I, I was like, there's no way this team could be that bad. You know, yeah, they're going to beat Arizona. They couldn't beat Arizona. <laughs> they're going to beat Tampa Giants. Bay. And they're going to beat the Giants. They, you know, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't fix anything. And that's in that final stretch. So it made me think, I'm like, you know what? Because I think to this day, Mike, they don't know what the hell happened. They still don't know. No. No, And I think like, you know, when I had Fletcher Cox on at the Super Bowl, he he was like, I'm still like, I I can't even come up with a reason. Britton Covey, a guy on the offense. Well, you know, obviously Britton doesn't play a lot of offense, but I thought his comments were very like, it was, And this could be Sirianni a little bit. I guess you can read it that way if you like. But, you know, when he said teams got better as the season went on, and we didn't. We did not make adjustments. Teams adjusted to us, and we didn't adjust to them. And who's at fault for that? I guess you got to put the head coach in that to some extent. But there's also the element that I do understand that maybe he felt he had the wrong people in place. Yeah, but he hired them. The one sure. thing we found out is but, he hired them. They weren't like wasted on him. They weren't how he hires. They were Sirianni fires. So if you got the wrong people in place, who's the blame? You oh, are. No, no question. But like Roseman, they like the guy enough to say you made a mistake. You're admitting your mistake. Now fix the mistake. And if you don't, now we have problems. Yeah. And that's where I think we are. And by the way, Jeffrey brought up San Francisco last year had major struggles when they had some injuries, when they lose three straight games, they recovered. Um, Kansas City had a bunch of struggles, recovered, and and we weren't able to. He mentioned those two teams specifically as being able to go through the adversity, figure it out, and have coaches that fix things. Nick Sirianni wasn't able to do that, and that's – uh, I'll leave it there. My last one at Mike Gill show. You back on the air today, Mike? Ninety-seven three ESPN South Jersey. I back am on the, the air today. Yes, back on the air two to six. So everybody locally tune in to to Mike this afternoon. Um, it, it, it you know it, if you bring in um, um, new coordinators and Jeffrey made this big, I think he called coordinators. I think is exact quote was coordinators are so important. So he did the old Jeffrey Lurie thing. He scapegoated, does it very nicely, very eloquently, very professorally, but he scapegoated and blamed it on the coordinators as essentially Nick Sirianni did to save his job. Now there's no more excuses. It is Nick Sir- Sirianni on the hot seat. Is he going to get fired if this team doesn't reach these massive expectations and you put whatever expectations you want, but now they have the weapon and Saquon Barkley. They have everything on offense. They have these two great coordinators. Um, What are the expectations? And if Nick Sirianni doesn't reach him, is he gone? Uh, I would say, yes, he was firmly on the hot seat. Um, That's should be pretty evident. Um, What are the expectations? Well, I think you're going to see a team. People might be like, how is this possible? Uh, The first power ranking of the year, they're in the top eight. So that's a team that probably has Super Bowl expectations in today's NFL. You know, you have a window of about five to eight teams that you probably think are in that. By the way, I'm surprised they're that low now after free agency. Because I think so many are so hyped about Saquon. I expected him to be top five by now. 
in those goofy well, power rankings. And then, of course, uh, you have the draft coming up, and we'll see how that shifts people's – you know, people were excited about this team after the draft last year after what they were able to do. So we'll see if that even shifts the excitement even more. So with all of that, the amount of moves they made – I would imagine that the interest and the hype and the expectations are going to be right back to where we're used to them being. So that would put you firmly on the hot seat. I saw one power ranking this morning that had him at six, number six in the NFL. Right, yeah. There you go. Uh, right. Inching up. Uh, uh, last thing this for is a me, team that, got, that lost six out of its last seven games. And they're, they're saying, you know what? Don't care. We trust what they do enough and what they've done this offseason enough to forget about that little seven-game stretch. That's like Jeff Laurie with uh, Nick Sirianni. Um, here's my last question, Mike Gill. Will you be using that $50 stipend that you got from X airport, X uh, airline, um, to be making your travel plans to Brazil for the Eagle game and the first Paolo. Friday of the season? That'll take a... Big. Hello, Brazil. You're a world traveler. You're a bon vivant kind of guy. Jeff Laurie was selling yesterday. He talked up Brazil like it's going to be the greatest game in the history of the NFL. And the Eagles are the forerunners. And they're cutting edge. And they're doing it for the league. He was taking a pretty good bow. Are you going to be there for the first South American NFL game, Mike Gill? Uh, a lot of it is contingent on uh, my girlfriend's son if he gets accepted to the Naval Academy or not, and there is no college tuition if there if that's no. the case. Wow, we do we do yeah. have it on our uh, our radar because we're going to London. And you got fifty bucks to burn. Yeah. Well, I don't think that airline flies to uh, oh, Rio de Janeiro. Oh, that sucks. Uh, but we are going to London to see the Phils. Cool, and we have discussed the Brazil trip. And if we don't do that, we might go to WVU Penn state in Morgantown. Yeah. San Paulo or Morgantown. That's a little cheaper yeah. to go to Morgantown than it is to Sao Paulo. You save yeah. a couple bucks doing that one, Gil. Le lean toward that. I go, friend. I, I, I would lean towards Morgantown. Don't yes. want to give you any advice, but I would lean towards Morgantown. I haven't been back since I left. So this really, be... you never wow. made it to a game. You talk them up, you wear the t-shirt, you've never been back since you graduated. It is so it's tough, man, because tough to get it, there, man. It's a sick, it's not easy to get there. It's a six hour drive. So to drive six hours to watch a game, to drive six hours home, it's a long weekend. Yeah. Right. I I did what the how long does it take to get to Cleveland? About was was it seven and a half or eight? We drove to Cleveland, yeah. went out for an Eagle game, left the night before, stayed in the hotel, got there late, did the uh, what's the, the bar area in Cleveland? The flats, flats. flats did the flats, yeah. and then went back to the crash, went to the Eagle game, boom, back in the car and drove back the all in 48 hours. So, uh, I've done more than six to, to go watch Eagles. You could do six to go to Morgantown. Uh, always a pleasure, Mike Gill. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much for coming back. Welcome we'll back you. with your travel difficulties. And, uh, yeah, 50 bucks is that you have to use in the airport? Is it food related or just travel? No, I think it's just for booking my next uh, flight. All right. so they, wanna... oh, they, they want you on another flight. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Mike, thanks, bud. We'll talk to you next week. All right, everybody. Thanks, Mike bud. Gill, 97.3 ESPN down the shore, the Sports Bash host back on the airwaves this afternoon. Uh, you got McDonald and McMone here on Birds 365. Oh, we got a surprise for you coming up in less than 15 minutes. Stay tuned for details. And Birds fans, if I got an offer for you, how would you like to save generously on your car insurance? How about 40% on your car insurance? You can do so right now with one of Jacob's Sports' great partners. Here's what you need to do. Call one of their two managing general partners, Fran or Jim or Jim or Fran, and tell them you're a friend of Jacob Sports and Birds 365. Hi, I'm Jim Muehlbronner, Managing Partner at DelVal Insurance Group. Give us a call. We're a local, knowledgeable agency, not an 800 number. Go Birds!
Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. You got your Mac and Mac guys, John McMullen and Jody McDonald hanging with you on Bird Street 65. The surprise I alluded to uh, prior to going to break was we're going to get Jeff Carr up here in about 10 minutes. You usually get Jeff Carr on Monday earlier on Bird's 365, but he was uh, at the uh, coaches meeting. Shame on him. He didn't get there early enough to get the seat right next to Sirianni yesterday. What, what the hell were you doing, Carr? Uh, but Jeff Carr is going to jump on with us in a Wednesday spot, which should be fun. Uh, and here's one of the things I want to run by Carr. I'm going to run by you now because we've been talking almost exclusive legals for the first hour and change of the show. I got a national question for you, Johnny Mac. Is NFL draft lying season starting early? We're still a month away from the draft. A month. It will be four weeks as of tomorrow. So that's a month away for me if it's more than four weeks. Um, I'm, I'm hearing things and I just uh, think that the lying season has begun and everybody lies around the NFL draft. The misinformation is better leading up to the NFL draft than anywhere, any place else in the world of sports. People just put stuff out there to try and misdirect teams on what they're going to do. I, I just love trying to sift through it and see what is actually right. I saw in two different places yesterday, J.J. McCarthy could be the second pick in the draft. Yeah. That, well, I will say, yeah. And that's because the owners' meetings and everything and all the executives are there. Right. I, so I they're, will they're, say. They're leaking out the misinformation. Yeah, potentially. I'm, you know, Washington is obviously number two. The thing about quarterbacks, quarterback, I will say NFL people seem to, and I mentioned this yesterday on the show, it's real. They like J.J. J.J. McCarthy's going really early. It's just a matter of how early. Um, and, well, really early is number two. Well, you know, four is really early, too. I, I would say top five top six is really early but that's my definition so right. anyway he's going pretty early how's that um will he go as high as number two 
I mean, it's always with quarterbacks, like here's where I guarantee you say you're a bad team. If there's like, there's four quarterbacks at the top of the draft this year uh, in the NFL's mind. If you like all four and you're an organization, I, I, I think you're a terrible organization. I mean, look at any year. All of those guys aren't going to hit. You have to have conviction, especially at that particular position. Um, and you can't say, oh, if I don't get so-and-so, I'll just take so-and-so. Maybe there's two, maybe there's three in very rare instances, but four, I, I mean, it, it never works. You know, just go go look back at the quarterbacks and the, and, and the recent drafts. Right. When and, was the last where time they we are. had four hits yeah. in the first four quarterbacks taken? Hasn't happened in decades. It may, yeah. nev- may have never happened. Yeah. Might so, be old for the history of the league. You know, if if you know, I Washington is the key. You know, Chicago's going to take Caleb Williams. We know that. Uh, although you know, they might shock the world. Who knows? Uh, that's more of my own questions over Caleb Williams. But he seems to be far and away. And your own uh, questions about Ryan Pole. Yeah, and, my own questions and about. And Ryan I'm Pulse. starting to line up behind you on that yeah. one. I well, kind of defended yeah. him for a while. I'm having less and less confidence in Ryan Paul for and, every mistake that he makes. You know, Washington, I start thinking about Kingsbury and what does Kingsbury want. And what, and then I start thinking, well, it's got to be Jaden Daniels for them. And then I look at, at, at Minnesota and they're going to trade up. And that's why Quasey's going to lose his job because he's, he's pigeonholed himself to a ludicrous degree with his own inefficiencies and, you know, to me, they have to pay. They're they're a perfect example. For them, it's got to be Drake May or J.J. McCarthy because of the offense they run. That's it. And it can't be, oh, we'll take Jaden Daniels. We'll take um, – because we've already seen Kevin o- – he's not changing. He's not changing. So it, it better be one of those two, and you better cross your fingers that that works out. And then you have New England – and I saw Mike Tannenbaum. He, he's throwing some crazy stuff out there that Arizona should take a quarterback and trade Kyler Murray. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff that's going to be coming, but I will say that the NFL people, that real, they really like J.J. McCarthy. And I'm with you. I don't get it. I, I, I You can't be a top five pick in the draft, and they don't let you throw the football in the biggest game of the year. Why? Just because Harbaugh says so? Because Harbaugh says he's really good. Well, then why didn't you have him pass for yeah. Mike? Doesn't make any sense to me. And here's where I'll relate th- this week's um, surprising elevation of McCarthy, the highest sights I've ever seen, number two. Didn't we go through this last year? Or, uh, season ends, it's a two-quarterback draft. It's going to be Stroud. It's going to be um, Bryce Young. I like Stroud better than Young. Took a victory lap for that one. Um, but I said both of them are going to be franchise quarterbacks. Uh, top two teams, top two picks, whoever they are, blah, blah, going to be fine. And then the, the buildup started for other guys. Anthony Richardson. Anthony Richardson could go number two. Anthony Richardson could be picked over Stroud by – no, it didn't happen. I went high. McCarthy could be that kind of play. Still going to be high, but not as high as some people put him. Could be the number two pick in the draft. Didn't happen. And the one that you got that just. Well, Anthony was fourth. I mean. Yeah, yeah but he high. wasn't second. It was the top two, and they were the top two, and then people tried to get someone over them. It didn't happen. The other one was some people thought Will Levis could go number two in the draft. And then the draft actually took place, and Will Levis was all the way down in the second round. But some people put Will Levis at the top of the draft. Didn't happen. The year before with Kenny Pickett, I thought Pickett was the best quarterback he was the only one that I thought was going to go in the first round. He did. People talked. You remember Malik Willis being talked up? Malik Willis yeah, would be the first yeah. quarterback taken in the draft. Well, Malik uh, Willis ahead of Kenny Pickett. Malik Willis went in the third round. When it comes to quarterbacks, and especially in the rare, and that was the Kenny Pickett draft was a bad quarterback draft, obviously. Kenny was the only quarterback to go in the first round, I believe. Was he the only? Yeah, yeah. only one. Uh, 20th, I believe 20th overall, um, that was a bad quarterback trap. So the, the, the general, and there are a lot of teams that panic and, and push 
quarterbacks up the board because of the position. Let's be honest. If, if quarterbacks, and I don't think they are, going to go one, two, three, four this year, they don't deserve. They're not the four no, best players. Really not even close. But it is the most important, uh, the, the by far, the most important job on an NFL team. So they always get pushed up the board. That tells you how bad that year was. The fact that another quarterback didn't get pushed up the board, that kind of tells you just how bad things were. Um, in 20, what was that? 2022. And then if you go back to 2021 in a more normal year, I mean, Trevor Lawrence was as clean as he get as a prospect. He's been good, but he hasn't been great. And then it was Zach Wilson and Trey Lance. That, And that's why I say these teams that set themselves up for disaster, like Chicago and Minnesota, I, I don't want to put Washington in that category because it's a new regime and, and they haven't been doing it for years. Um, it usually doesn't work out. It, it just doesn't. It, um, usually, it usually doesn't work out. It's only four weeks away, and I am so intrigued by the way the top of the draft is going to work out. The Eagles don't pick till 22nd, but the top is going to be with the quarterbacks, with the team needs, with the misinformation, which is starting early. Because I do recall this about the Levis and about the Malik. Usually you got within two weeks of the draft. Then you had to get close enough to, if you're going to miss uh, leak misinformation, you want to make it stick. This is going out early. This is a month before. I don't it's think crazy. it's, I don't, I don't think it's, boy, I, I think he's, I think he's going top five. So if you consider the two part of it, misinformation. Okay. Yes. But I, yes, I that's think exactly I, what I'm saying, but there's a big difference between top five and 33, which I think will Levis like, I mean, I don't think he's falling out of the first round. Um, I think he's going top 10. You know, I think the low uh, Minnesota already traded to get another first round pick to make another move up to get a quarterback. Cause they're so desperate they can't go with Sam Darnold. That's their starting quarterback right now. That's how desperate they are. That's the floor. What? How high can they get up? That's going to be top 10. Yeah, it's funny that you went Sam Darnold, and Minnesota just signed him, whatever, a month, uh, how many weeks ago, during free agency to be kind of a safety net or whatever. That's what I see J.J. McCarthy's career looking like. Sam Darnold? Ooh, yeah. yeah, That'll yeah. be exciting for four the years, Vikings four, fans. By, by the time we're into year number, how many years has Darnold played? Jets for four, Carolina for one, and San Francisco. San Francisco. So yeah. Six years in the league. Still so young. His maybe, fourth maybe. team. He's on his fourth team. That yeah. could be J.J. McCarthy, six years. And by now. the way, I'm I will predict, with the six pick I the will predict Sam Darnold's year. Was he just with San Francisco for a year? That's uh, it. it. One yeah. year backup and one year uh, in Carolina. It, his year with Kyle Shanahan will make him a better quarterback than just about any rookie quarterback. Not the upside. Not I'm not talking upside. Right. Ready to step in play yes. Yes. for the year. That, yeah. you, you're probably right about that. That's right. why. Go ahead, Minnesota. Jump up there to get J.J. McCarthy and then have him sit behind Sam Darnold. How's that going to play with Viking yeah. fans? Real good. Better win yeah. some games. Better Real win. Real good. Hi, right, he's McMullen. I'm McDonald. We got Jeff Kerr on a Wednesday. That means it's a good Wednesday as far as I'm concerned. Jeff Kerr, CBS Sports, up next here on Birds 365. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker, Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was gonna be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was gonna be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was gonna be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing, the second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs, and then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Maga Mac Bird Street 65 here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Damn, hit that like button. Like Jeff Kerr. I like Jeff Kerr. We hope you like Jeff Kerr. Hit the like button and help us out with our algorithm. Jeff Kerr is coming us to us from, is that your hotel in Orlando? Are you still down there, JK? Oh, I'm still down there. I've been in Lake Buena Vista since Friday, and I've been in Florida since last Wednesday. Yeah, Disney World last night. Did you night. high five, how, Mickey? How did, did you go? high five? Go, yeah. Mickey. Go, Mickey. No, nah, you- nah, I, nah, I did um, uh, do some high fives with Chip and Dale, though. Um, they, they, I did see Scrooge McDuck, so I was pretty excited about that. Did too. you get the Mickey ears? Can we? Can you I, put those I, on for us? <laughs> no, I, I don't have the Mickey ears. I, I bought stuff, but not Mickey ears. That's right. disappointing. Uh, and I would have loved to see you sit next to Nick Sirianni with the Mickey ears yesterday. That would have been true. <laughs> well, well, we'll move on from there. Um, Jeff uh, Laurie yesterday, Nick Sirianni earlier yesterday, Howie Roseman the day before. You've been there for all of it. What grabbed your attention more than anything else? What was one thing that was said that either you were surprised by or uh, disappointed by or ticked off about or just elated by? Was there something one of the three big power brokers of the Philadelphia Eagles said that grabbed uh, Jeff uh, Kerr by the short ones and made you go, wow? I mean, stuff I've heard out there, I don't think they're ready to part with Hassan Reddick just yet. Really? I, I think it's. I think if they get an offer, a good offer, they'll do it. But they're just not going to give him for pennies on the dollar. I think they're they're trying to find ways to keep him happy and still try to trade. I, I really don't think they know what they're going to do. But if worse comes to worse, they they keep him. And quite honestly, I think they should keep him. And Nick even said yesterday a couple times when you were talking about the pass rushers, he always mentioned the son's name in there. So. They're going to mention yeah, him until he's. He, did. he mentioned him last, though, didn't he? He kind of got yeah, to Hassan yeah. and he was like, oh, I forgot Hassan. That's how I kind of took that. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You don't catch it until after he says it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's that was one. Um, the whole we don't value running back comment from Howie Roseman, I thought was pretty uh, I- I- interesting considering they did pay Saquon Barkley a lot. And I know how he was being sarcastic there because he was talking about Brian Westbrook. He was talking about LaShawn McCoy. But the running back position is more valuable yeah, that, you know, that, when LaShawn McCoy I was there. I don't like that spin, Jeff, because we all know you used to pay running backs. That's not the point since, you know, you're the one who built two Super Bowl rosters. I, I say during the Howie 2.0 era, he, 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 he helped devalue the position. Let's be honest. Because yeah. he showed everybody else you could build Super Bowl rosters without um, paying that particular position. Everybody copycats. 
And I, I brought this up. If you want to give Howie credit, market inefficiency so we could take advantage of it when the right player came along. Is he playing 3D chess? Did we give him that uh, much credit? I, I think he is. It's He always does seem to be playing chess when everybody else is either trying to play chess or they're playing checkers. So now it's, okay, DeAndre Swift got this much. We have the cap space. Why don't we go get a guy like this who wants to come here? He wanted – Saquon wanted to be an Eagle. I just didn't think the Eagles would actually be interested in him. And then everything just kind of happened, and it's a whirlwind. That's all everybody wanted to talk about was Saquon yeah, Barkley. Yeah. It, He's a weapon. It's, He's special. It, it's crazy. So I was sitting right next to Dan Quinn yesterday uh, before I went to Nick, and no one asked him about anybody in the division. And, and – quarterback it was everybody he knew what everybody was trying to do okay let's let's butter me up here and then we'll go to quarterback i think he actually liked the brian johnson question i gave him you know what what gave you what how did i word it i'm trying to remember how i said it now but what gave you the impression that brian johnson would be the right guy for a your offense and b develop your quarterback and he went on this like five minute spiel about johnson and i said is brian johnson going to help you pick your quarterback or is he going to give you the decision making? And it's, that's what that started the whole collaborative effort thing. And he was talking about him, Adam Peters, Brian Johnson, Cliff Kingsbury. It seems like they're the four that are going to find the right guy. And it's going to be JJ his, McCarthy. JJ McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it's a, BS. I think you were getting BS yesterday, Kerr. I think you're part of that misinformation crew. You were giving stuff, lead you down a path to make you go JJ McCarthy. Not happening. I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> it's still gonna get you. some. You're not buying it if they're selling. Good for you. No, it, it was funny because um John Kime actually joked. He said, Why can't Williams falls to number two? And Quinn just winked at him. <laughs> okay. So, um, hey, Quinn, Quinn's a good guy, but um Dable, he got he was slammed yesterday. Uh, John, you have enjoyed it. There Brian, like there were fifteen Brian's struggling. Yeah. Yeah. There were 15, 20 people at the Eagles media table. There might have been double that right next to him at the Giants yesterday. Really? really? Wow. That's yeah. rare. That's it, not, not usually the case. Yeah. No, but it, it, everybody just wanted a piece of why everything went so bad. And he got so many Saquon questions. He got so many, like, what's he doing? What are you doing with this team? So well, many he, Daniel Jones had, questions. They had such a good start. I thought they were going in the right direction. Brian Dayball, Joe Shane. Now I'm like, oof, I don't know. I don't know. It's not going to last much longer. You got John Harris already saying stuff about Dayball. Just, ugh, it's not going to end well. John, your boy, JG. I felt bad for him. There were like two people at his table. I just walked right up. Nobody it's, cares. It, it, yeah, well, he loves wanna, it. He'll I love that. Hey, I know he loves it. Yeah. JG hey, loves this, right is, that. Yeah. this is how much he loves it. So everybody's done. He's still talking. He just goes up. I'm getting breakfast. He just goes up, gets breakfast, starts, you know, shooting, you, you know. And then he just sits at the table with media guys. He's like, there's some more questions. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer yeah, he's them. A good, he's a good dude. I tell him. Steichen everything. was like that, too. Yeah. Like, no one cared about the Colts. It's Those yeah. two are in perfect situations. Hold yeah. on. Let me take a scoop of my scrambled eggs. But I'll answer your question. I can see Gannon doing that. All right. Here's – I want to get back to your Hassan Reddick thing because Mike Gill was on with us before you, and he said, the Eagles have been great in managing the cap, and you can evidence that by the fact that they've never had to cut anybody. Someone that we really, truly believed they liked, but they had painted themselves into a salary cap corner and had to let somebody go and get nothing in exchange for them other than cap relief. They haven't had to do that in a long time. When was the last time the Eagles had a guy who was in camp, holding in, holding out, call it what you want, the rules change, so the Winter Players Act changes as well. If they don't give Hassan, if they can't come to an agreement with a, uh, Hassan on some kind of reworking of his deal, like they did with Josh Sweat, and they say, Hassan, here's the opening day camp, we kind of expect you to be there, that's not going to go well. That's not going to play well. That's not going to be Hassan say, yeah, I'm a good soldier, I'll be there. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. When was the last time the Eagles had a guy that really was an issue in camp because of contract situation? Was it T.O.? Was that the last guy? 
Um, I'd have to think about that. I can't think of anybody in the Roseman era. Well, I can't think of anybody recently. Well, well, Deshaun, well Deshaun, I guess, kind of forced it, but they paid him early. Yeah, they usually do a good job with that stuff. Um, and the rules have taken care of a lot of it. Uh, Hassan was the closest thing last year, which is more of like when he showed up with a, a groin injury. We're all wondering if it was a hold in, as Jody pointed out, because you're not going to hold out. Um, and nope. Three days later, it was back at practice. Um, yeah, they generally do a good job with that stuff, I would say. Now, they do lose players. Last year, they lose a bunch, they lost a bunch of players. Now, that was their part of their whole plan. We we're going to lose a bunch of players coming off the right, Super Bowl. Get the, a way, the way Gil players. asked the question, to be fair, was cut a guy, not, no, not yeah, resign I know. a guy. I know. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That a whole bunch of guys last year they chose not to resign. And they paid the price for when it. They, when price. they cut a guy, it's usually because they're ineffective. Like, they might cut James Bradbury post-June 1st, depending on what happens in the draft or what they can do in, in the market, trade, something of that nature. They may cut him, but they won't cut him because they have to cut him. They'll cut him because of um, it didn't work out. He didn't play it's, well. It's so funny that you went to Bradbury because that's how they got Bradbury. The Giants yes. didn't really want to cut Bradbury, but they got the cap mess and somebody had to go, and Bradbury ended up playing the paying the price. So there was an exact example of it up the turnpike with the Giants, cutting a guy you don't really want to cut purely for cap purposes. The Eagles have not done that much over the last several years. That's to their credit. No, they're good at it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's why I constantly – how he's how he's a good GM. In part and and even the, when they all cut – they're, they're able to find a trade partner, a la Carson Wentz. Well, I tell Jody all the time, and he can tell you, I, they don't sign bad contracts. So when I, they, 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 Every contract you see is not a bad contract from the – every single one is not those a bad void, contract. Those void years, baby, they, they now, help out big time. It might not work out because the evaluation of the player might be off, but it is not a bad contract from a bookkeeping – I always say, from Jake Rosenberg's standpoint, he's in charge of this stuff. No one's going to him and saying, boy, that's a terrible contract, Jake. He, he's doing his job. The personnel people, the evaluation, that's the more difficult part. And sometimes those contracts don't work out because the players don't play up to their perceived abilities. So it's kind of different. Agreed. You got to balance those two things. And I think the Eagles have had a great balance between the evaluation and the structuring of the contracts. So, Jeff, you may sound like they're going to keep us on Reddick. Here's what scares me. Have you heard any? And I'm on CBSSports.com all the time. And you, yourself and other good NFL writers have thrown some Hassan Reddick interest rumors out there. Why do I think none of them have any traction? that I think it's just picking logical teams that uh, let's tie them to Gannon. Let's tie them to Steichen. Yeah, Are Arizona and or the Colts ever going to actually put a decent offer on the table? I'm not feeling it these days. No. I think they're caught between a rock and a hard place when it's on e the Eagles. Yeah, I, They're waiting for them to what John said. Cut them. And they can get them for nothing. They're not yeah, giving it. They're yeah, not they're not giving it. Exactly. They don't have to cut them. So – Work something out. It's you work something out last year. You gave him a little bump, and he got a twenty. He has a twenty-one million dollar cap it this year. I don't know why he can't do it. Uh, if yeah, I think I, that I think that's going to be the end game, Jeff. They're going to work out a reworked one-year deal, essentially, where he gets a bunch of guaranteed money up front, and then I'll hit free agency next year. Um, I think that's going to that's the more likely scenario because other. We saw Legereus Sneed, what do you get? A third round pick, a future third future round pick. Third. Yeah, he um, yeah, they ain't got much for him. No. So I I you know, but then I start thinking, all right, now you have Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat's back and he reworked his deal and Bryce Hupp is here and you want to get Nolan Smith involved and BG's still here. And now all of a sudden they're talking about Zach Bond like he's uh Andrew Van Ginkle. Um at what point is 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 it too much at one? Do you think the Eagles knew the kickoff rule was changing 
and that led to the Zach Bond thing. Because now all of a sudden you have an athletic pass rusher slash linebacker who's really good special teams. Oh, and by the way, they changed the kickoff rule. I, I think, yeah, I think everybody knew. Um, eventually they were going to get it through. I think a lot of people thought it wouldn't be till May, but yeah, I think most thought it was going through. So that's it. Yeah. Maybe, you know, who, who said, you know, maybe it's the next Ike Reese and Jody asked me that question. I said, no, under the existing, under the previous rules. And I said, no, not because of anything dismissive of Zach Bond. There's no opportunity to be a great special teams player. When there's no kick coverage, um, but there's going to be, be a kick good... coverage. It's going to be different, but there's going to be kick. No, coverage. that's what I mean. Yeah, there so is. Now, there's going to be a lot more returns now. Now a it's lot more. more. Now it's going to be more important, and it's going to be more important to find a kickoff returner as well. Um, and maybe Paris Campbell, maybe he fits in there um, as well. So it becomes more important special teams. And I like that, by the way, that's one of the positives to me of the NFL's owners meeting. I'd like the new kickoff. All right. But here's yeah. where, here's where the Eagles may have missed out. Both of you guys specifically John, because I know he talked them up a blue streak over his career. Cordell Patterson signed. Yeah. He signed right. Steelers. Signed How right the Eagles away. not get him? Johnny Mack comes out here singing his My praises goal. all the time. Greatest kick returner in the history of oh, the NFL. He is. He is, it's now man. back in he play. Is. He is. He's had a chance to get him. I, I have never seen a kick returner like that. He actually won a game because Chip Kelly wouldn't kick to him. Literally wouldn't kick to him. He won the game. Didn't do anything. Won the game. They started every drive at the freaking 40. Um, yeah. He just went kick. And yeah. he, I remember that game. Chip just – it was 2013, right? Yeah. When they played um, – we played the Minnesota. I mean, yeah, he wouldn't kick to him. And by the way, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a bad team. But there's a guy, yeah, I I do I because he's you know he's that manufactured touch player that drives me insane that people talk about all the time and they never get him involved. And he's another guy I talk about. But as a kick returner, man, man, he's good. Uh, the old school. I don't know how the new school is going to look, um, but. You know, he he's a seven-time All-Pro <laughs> just because of kick returns. <laughs> seven-time All-Pro has the most kickoff return touchdowns in NFL history. It's, I mean, I, I know they put De- Devin Hester in, but that guy's got to get consideration when he's done, right? All all decade team, all because of kick returns. But that's you know that's a yeah. I don't think that's a Hall of Fame player. I think you got. I can't put a kick returner in there. Maybe it's not fair, but that's the way I feel. But if one should be in there, it should be him. He's the Justin Tucker of kick returners. We, we always joke about this at CBS. Like we look for guys that are going to, yeah, you know, not get page views, but you know, are going to get engagement. He he always gets engagement, no matter what we write about him. If he doesn't touch the ball, if he does touch the ball, uh, the year he broke out in fantasy, we couldn't write enough about him. Yeah, and he was out there for the getting, and the Eagles did. Well, the Steelers did. I am surprised. Nine, uh, nine kickoff return touchdowns, by the way, and and half of his career under when he barely re- was able to return kicks because everybody just kicks it out of the end zone. Right, they don't give him a chance. And by, by the way, John, what do you what do you think teams are going to do? Do you think they'll still kick it out of the end zone, or do you think they'll actually kick it to the returner? I think they'll kick it to the returner. I was looking at some of the XFL stats because I'm a loser. Um, yeah, and, I, uh, I had to do it yesterday too. So, but yeah. I'm both being um, losers. Um, and they did a good job covering them. And it, you know, to me, it becomes you know an analytical thing for NFL teams. If you get past the thirty, they'll start kicking it out out of the end zone. If it doesn't, and they can cover them, they they won't. And I think the XFL numbers were. Very rarely did you get it out past past the thirty or thirty five. So um, I think uh, it depends on how successful they are. Touchback yeah, comes out to the thirty five now. Thirty. 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 It yeah. Was well, one, one, one year. Yeah. That's what they were voting on. So Monday night, I was told it was pretty much all going to be approved. It was <laughs> they were determining where it was going to be the thirty or the thirty five. Yeah. It was originally going to be the thirty five, and then they moved it to the thirty. Is what I heard to get it through. 
because people were concerned about the 35. Yeah, right? but yeah. They, and, now, and, and then they're going to put the vote next year. If yeah. the way you're describing it, John, is true that they had to move it back just to get it passed, they lessened it. It, it, they should have kept it at the 35 to try and make the kicker. And the kicker's going to have new responsibilities. The perfect placement of where to put it to try and get it covered is going to be huge. I'm with you. I think they'll tell the guys, listen, say, screw the NFL. Kick it out. Kick it through the goalposts. We'll start playing defense at the 30. The, the, the Packers might do that. It might have been a difference. The Packers might do that if they can get a better kicker than Andrews uh, Cars- Carlson. They're about ready to move on from him. Okay. Uh, they signed Greg Joseph, who missed yeah. her inconsistency. Uh, by the way, Daniel Carson, a tremendous kicker. What what happened to Anders? Yeah, I don't know. All right. Jeff Kerr, I uh, brought this up with John. I brought it up with Mike Gill earlier. When Nick Sirianni said, when I hired Kellen Moore, and he did it kind of definitively, <laughs> yeah. it grabbed my attention. He didn't say we, he didn't say the Eagles. <laughs> He said it, and he didn't say, and I hired Kellen Moore. No, he said, and I hired Kellen Moore. He's, like, taking ownership of it. But then afterwards, he said, Kellen's in. Kellen's working hard. What's the offense going to be like? I don't know. Don't ask me, Mr. Competitive Advantage. Was that the whole relationship between Kellen Moore, how he got the job, how he got hired, what he's doing, what he's going to do? Is that not confounding to you? Jeffrey that- Lurie even doubled down on it, saying, well, you know, this is how I pick a head coach, and this is what I do, and this this works for us. I have never picked a head coach outside of one guy who was a play caller. And I'm like, all right, Jeff, you know, you can, <laughs> you, you can, cut, you can cut it a bit. So, but yeah, I, I, it's like – it's almost like Nick, Nick is – the Josh Harris of the Eagles. He's just going to sit back and he'll talk when he has to talk. And, you know, Kellen, Kellen Moore was a – Nick's all about the player relationship. I guess that's that's what Jeffrey Lurie said. That's what Howie Roseman said. That's what Nick said. So, I, I mean, I guess, I guess he kind of knows what's going on with Kellen Moore. I, I just think every time Nick talks, I just think he gives us a bunch of you-know-what. He certainly did. With, he went he, – well, he admitted. And to his credit, he was in full competitive advantage mode. He said, I'm not giving you guys anything about the offense. I mean, just to give you a heads up, not that we. He, he does um, that off the record. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so that part, but Jeffrey did really talk up the coordinators. Um, and that to me puts a more of a expectation on, on Nick Sirianni as far as being a lame duck. Uh, they better win some games because Jeffrey Lurie seems to think they have two great uh, offensive and yeah, he, two he, offensive he's defensive co- He is convinced they significantly improved at both yeah. those positions. Yeah, and they did defensively, um, probably offensively. They definitely did defensively. But, again, it's personnel first. Now, the Eagles have a ton of personnel on the offensive side. Defensively, there's still a bunch of stuff to figure out. And I would say of the two, if you said, who's the better coach, Vic Fangio or Kellen Moore, I'd say Vic Fangio. If you ask me who's going to be more successful, I'd say Kellen Moore. Players. Players first. Players, players, players. Um, Are the Eagles good enough to live up to the expectations Jeffrey Lurie set yesterday, which were pretty large? Now he's not under oath, as I always say, but if he was talking, it's basically Super Bowl or bust from what he said. We got to get back to where we are, were, and better. What's better? Winning the Super Bowl. You got to the Super Bowl. Are they good enough? Not right now. Um, offensively, I think they're they're good enough to win a Super Bowl, even without Jason Kelsey. Defensively. I'm not sold on what they did at linebacker. They keep Hassan Reddick. I'll feel a lot better about this team, but I like the CJ Garner Johnson move. I still think they could add another safety in there. I, I'm fine with them bringing back Slay and Bradbury because of who they got behind them. Guys that developed last year, but I'm concerned at linebacker again. It's okay. You're banking everything on the Kobe Dean and Devin white. That's awesome. But you need something back there. Exactly. It, 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 no, I'm joking. Zach Bond's gonna run some faster, John. I know, you know this. I know, I know. And you know um, what I love? You know what I love there, John? Jeff Kerr combined Sam 
uh, Bradford and James Bradbury and came up with Sam Bradbury. Uh, Sam never Bradbury. heard that. Never heard that one before. Sam Bradbury. Uh, <laughs> it's been a I, long couple days it, for Jeff. Yeah, you know, it is. Hey, well, hey, you know what, guys? I was at Disney till eleven forty-five last night, and that yeah, was when I, I got off the last ride because I had to ride Seven Dwarfs Mine Train again. Did you ever get like the, on? Uh, did you ever get on Space Mountain? Did you I did get on Space Mountain last night. I, I. By the way, Test Track is closing for renovation. I was on that at least five times during the whole nice. trip. I, I've so I, I did. All right, here's uh, the big question. Did Saquon Barkley induce Jason Kelsey to come back yesterday on the New Heights podcast? He's recruiting him to come back. Yep. We have a contributor here to Birds 365. He'll go name us, Groats, who has said that he thinks Kelsey is coming back. Oh, he said that the day he retired he was coming back. Exactly. He's been playing that tune since they struck up the band. Neither John nor I think he has a prayer. But damn, if Saquon wasn't trying yesterday, did he hit a chord? Did he at least make Jason Kelsey think about, you know, it could be cool blocking for Saquon Barkley. What was your response when you heard that, Jeff Carr? Jason Kelsey's just waiting for the highest offer from Amazon, Fox, CBS. That, oh, that, that's my... Oh, you in the mix, too. Don't, don't leave out the uh, leader the, in sports. I don't, I don't know if he's going to go to ESPN. No, we saw, I saw I'm somebody here on the stream today say Monday Night Football, that they're thinking about yeah. carving out a spot for Jason Kelsey on Monday Night Football for ESPN. Yeah, we'll do you see. think – do you think – so do you think Jason's going to be more in the pregame stuff or do you think he'll be more in the in-game stuff? I think he's a pregame guy. That's my – I think I he is. Mission. I think he's an in-game guy. Dude. I think he's that good. Color I think guy? he understands yeah. the game that well that he does. Well, I, 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 I'm just going to say this, and keep in mind, the company I work for here, Bill Cowher is not under contract. Boomer Sison is not under contract. Oh, really? I did not know that. I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Drop just, knowledge, just, Jeff Kerr. just putting two and two together here. Just, just saying. All right, so I, we'll I, also I, hey, I made them. my pitch to him. I don't know if it's going to work, but I made my pitch. Um. I don't know if you're going to Brazil land, San Paulo land, while you're while down in uh, Brazil. But are the Eagles going to play the Cleveland Browns or the Green Bay Packers? What's Jeff Kerr's? Uh, oh man, you know what? I I think Maurice Hurst kind of spilled the beans, and when I was talking to some people in Cleveland, it does seem like the Browns are the team. But now, yeah, see, he's breaking news. I saw the yeah. Packers. One of the Packers guys was talking. To yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark Murphy said it on, Mark, on Mark yesterday. Was the one who cut it down to two and said yeah. it's us or the Browns. Yeah, and, I mean, it is the Browns or the Packers. That's that's everything I was told. But it just it seems like it's going to be the Browns, and they're really big on picking a big opponent there. I I, I don't understand why the league decided to put that game on Peacock. Like that was the Peacock exclusive regular the season money. game. There we go, money. I mean, oh, well, they, they can make money right. on any on any broadcast network too. Well, right? they're yeah. also, you know, that's the future. They also want to get people used to streaming because they think that's the future. So that's and I'm sure of both of you guys saw this. They trumpeted this pretty good of the guys, and they can figure it out. I have no idea how to do, but they do. Seventy one percent of the people who for this year's NFL playoff game on Peacock specifically joined Peacock Kept it. to watch yep. the game, 71% retained Peacock thereafter. That's yeah. huge. That's it, it was giant. A, I, I, I will tell NBC yeah. was going to pay yeah. going yeah. forward for that. If they can get that kind of result, that kind of yeah. return, you pay your millions, billions of dollars for that. I, I, I told people this when I first heard there was 21 million people that watched that wild card game. That is a major, major success for the National Football League. And, yeah. and like you said, Joe, they're keeping it. I don't blame them for doing it. I just want to pick Peacock to have another game. What, what I really wanted to know is, and again, I was finding out pretty much what everybody else was finding out, they were going to play on Christmas. Not only are they going to play on Christmas. Two games. Two games. On, two, two games on, yeah. And they the said Saturday, last year we're not playing on Christmas Wednesday. And now they're like, oh, yeah, we're playing on Christmas. Oh, uh, yeah, because you, 50 million Adam people. Over. Yeah. 50 million people watched football on Christmas yeah. on last year. So, of course, and I love what Goodell's like, well, okay, we're going to – those guys are going to play the Saturday before so they get their, their rest and, the, their, you know, it's like the Sunday or Thursday thing. But 
Doesn't that devalue your Saturday slate because it's going to be the same teams? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, they don't care. Yeah, they'll just roll them out whenever they want to and get their twenty plus million to watch because so, they're they're the big dog that can't be beat. So this is what, and I I was talking to somebody about this. So that Christmas week, you're going to have games on Sunday or Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. Saturday again and Sunday again. Is that correct? And he said, that's the plan. Oh, man. Yeah, this it's a league, lot of football. You know, I don't yeah. know. I break one of my own rules because I try not to get mad at hypocrites because I found out hypocrites don't care that they're hypocrites. And, you know, the that's NFL. That's why they're hypocrites. Make, yeah. The NFL will make this big grand. Oh, we got to. We got to ban the hip drop tackle, but yeah, play on Wednesday, play on short rest, you know, yeah, play on crappy turf, do, do this. We care about health. We don't care about health, man, man, they're hypocritical, but they don't care. Right. I, I, I just think, and again, I've watched sports. I'm a fan of sports that oversaturation was a bad thing. I don't know if it'll ever happen in the NFL, but eventually the bubble is going to pop at some point. You would think. I, I I don't know about you, Jeff Carr, but I've been saying that for 20 yeah. years now. Yeah. I've been saying it, it for it longer, never, I think, Jeff. Yeah, yeah probably even longer than By the way, the product oh, stinks. Bigger. The product stinks. It's not as good as it work. was 20 years ago. It wasn't. Like, you know what, John? Pete Prisco and I were talking about this uh, Monday night. We, we were talking about how much better the NFL was. So, but I, I sounded just like Pete. I sound like an old head. Well, I mean... <laughs> Look, it is what it is. And you have this whole group of people, and I got them on Twitter when I made fun of the hip drop tech, and they want to feel like good people and say, whoa, you don't care about people's health. No, it's not that. It's you can't. And by the way, if you want to sit on your high horse, here's what you do. Say, don't play football because football is a violent sport. And if you don't want people hurt, as Zach Ertz will tell you and every other football player, the injury rate in this league remains 100%. It will be 100% after they ban the hip drop tackle mm -hmm. because it's a violent game. So you're the hypocrite saying, I care about their health. No, you don't, because then you'd be picking in to ban this freaking game. That's what you would be doing. I happening. will tell you this. What a coach said to me, we will – and it was a defensive coach. We will find out a way to – adjust to it like we always do and then they'll find a way to ban what we adjust to yeah that's probably pretty accurate jeff kerr a pleasure <laughs> my friend uh go get on what are you coming uh, back? back one more time I'm, I'm coming back to that you see i don't think they want me to leave because my flight was supposed to leave at 6 50 tonight and it got delayed to 7 30 so. wow well we just had uh, mike gill his flight got delayed what four hours? Yeah, Mike three said? three hours and change. You only three pushed back forty minutes. You're lucky at this point, Car. What's going You're on down there? Is there bad? I, I, uh, no, it's great weather down here. I don't know. It, it, Mike Gill's using American Airlines. He, he probably got the same problem. Uh, I'm not well. American, you're screwed. Sorry. Yeah. American. Here. All right. Uh, we dealt dealt this better. Before yeah. we besmirch any other potential clients, uh, we'll say <laughs> we'll say goodbye to Jeff Kerr. <laughs> JK, safe flight home, brother. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks. Thanks, bud. Quickie timeout for Mac and Mac. We got to come back and put a bow on the show. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker, Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was gonna be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was gonna be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was gonna be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech, we offer three major services, the first one being basement waterproofing, the second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. You got Mac and Mac here wrapping up a Wednesday edition of Birds 365. Johnny Mac, when is the press conference? We know we heard from Jeff Lloyd. We know we heard from Harry Rose. We know we heard from Nick Sirianni. There's one more major Philadelphia Eagle figure I want to hear from. Is Big Dom going to have a press conference at the uh, airport? Yeah. Or, Big uh, Dom's what, a big star now. He is. is. That's, I got to hear from Big Dom. I need to know what Big Dom yeah. is thinking these days. Are we going to have a Big Dom press gathering? You will never hear from uh, Dom DeSandro. In a press gathering, he is I he is very cool, that. is he not? He's just he's cool. Yeah, uh, he's a great dude. Um, you see, you were there. You see some of the behind the scenes hygiene. Hey, what were the, the colors training. again? You guys live and die with those colors. I had no idea yeah. they were color. Well, Dom, what was that again? Yeah, the, Dom, Dom loves. I I think he said mob. I I don't know, uh, but you know that uh, uh, that's who I always get. Dom is the guy I always get my information of what practice is green red as you mentioned uh 50 minutes uh, hour and a half and he always he's old school like us he's a yeah tough day they're going 60 70 minutes mocking it um you know the old school two a days yeah he's a great guy he's become a big star but he doesn't like being in the public eye no he does um, not dislikes it in fact and um yeah, I don't know. That that took on a uh, life of its own. Um, and now yeah, people I, saying he's reeling in Nick Sirianni. I don't want to go that far, but uh, he is yeah. a very important part. And Jeffrey mentioned it. Um, his job is much more than, you know, bodyguard, right. so to speak. Um, and, you know, he, his title now, special assistant to the GM, I believe, reflects it. Uh, as long and, and and the security stuff as well, but yeah, he's a big I'm, part of the organization. I'm just saying he be he may be meritorious of a John Clark takeoff podcast. I'm just he he has reached those high heights that Johnny Clark may have to get down to the airport and get him. I don't think he's yeah. doing it, but you never know with Johnny Clark. You never that's, know. So, that's why I'm saying he's that good. He can he can suck people in, and he may get big dot. By the way, I saw the Kelsey thing, and that came from Andrew Marshan. Andrew's usually plugged in with that stuff. So Monday night pregame might be the uh, the case for Jason Kelsey. Uh, yes, he uh, I, I, I'd love to give the person credit on our stream here. Um, it went by 50 minutes ago, whenever it was. But that's the first place I saw. It was right here on the stream. Somebody speculated. And they might have gotten it from Marshan, but I had not yet heard that, uh, that yeah. ESPN big time player for Kelsey and 
retirement in Monday Night Football. So um, uh, kudos to whoever it was. You know who you are on our stream who put it up there. Good on you. You're the first place I saw it right here on the Mac and Mac stream here on Birds 365. All right. Do you think we did a good enough job? Sucking them in to get them to come back tomorrow, McMullen. Yeah, man. Uh, Birds 365, it never stops, even though the owners' meetings have stopped. We'll get into draft. We're, we got to get into draft mode. Pretty Free, so tomorrow tomorrow is, is four weeks out. No, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So tomorrow's Thursday. So one day plus uh, four weeks out. J.J. McCarthy going number two. J.J. McCarthy. Don't fall for it. Don't get sucked oh, in. I, I'm Red not sure. Fans or are Eagle they? fans want to see the Redskins crash. The Redskins. Commanders, Commanders. crash and burn. Not My, happening. No, not happening. He's I, not I, going I, number two. I think it's going to be Jaden Daniels or Drake May at number two to the Commanders. That's their big decision. Um, and then, you know, is is – New England taking a the quarterback, they pretty much have to, don't they? I think so, but that's me. Um, you know, who might actually come out of this smelling like a rose. Your boy Quessy. If Drake May falls down the board, if someone is foolish enough to go JJ McCarthy and May comes down the board to the fourth quarterback taken, which could be the seventh spot in the draft. You might get the best quarterback in the draft with the seventh pick. Yeah, crazy. Uh, uh, Josh McCown, who's now the uh, Vikings quarterbacks coach, I think I mentioned that he coached uh, Drake uh, May in in high school when his own son Owen McCown. Where's Owen gone? He was a big time college prospect at uh, one point. Um, I don't know if he. But he was coaching his son's team, and and Drake May was on that team, which I did not know at the time. But obviously, he's turned into a a, a big time prospect. Uh, Owen McCown is um, was at Colorado. Obviously, now they jumped to fifteen different spots. Now he's at Texas San Antonio. Oh, UTSA. All right. Um, and by the way, that's same that we'll save for tomorrow. Dion dictating terms about his son. Oh, and his come on, wide Dion, receiver. Stop, he, stop. He, he, he threw the name Eli out there. That's something we'll save for tomorrow's Bird 365, which we will do. John McMullen and Jody McDonald back with you in two and two. You've been listening to Birds 365, the destination for the passionate Eagles football fan who bleeds green. If it's Eagles football, we're talking about it. Debate inside the locker room and guests that are some of the greatest football minds from around the region. We hope you enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on social media at Jacob Sports. See you next time on Birds 365.